Welcome, hi everybody. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the uh, even more cool stuff track. Um, yes, that's what they officially call it. Um, first, a bit about myself. My name is Martin Helmich. I'm working as a software architect at Midwald CM Service. We are a web hosting service provider from northern Germany, and we had a very big amount of luck on Monday to make it here, uh, despite of the weather. So, yes, now I'm here, and I'd like to talk to you about agile software development and, in special, behavior-driven development. <coughs> so before I begin, I'd like to do a quick show of hands. Who of you has already heard the term behavior-driven development? And reading it in the conference flyer does not count. <coughs> all right, three people. Um, all right, then a follow-up question. Um, is anyone already practicing behavior-driven development? All right, so that's pretty cool. Um, I was half afraid that most of people would already know everything that I was going to say, but that's great. Um, <clears throat> I don't intend for this talk to get too technical. Um, I'm going to introduce a few tools that you can use in order to develop behavior driven, but the focus of this talk is going to be on how you can integrate this process of behavior-driven development into your software development process. <coughs> um, yes, and there I already come to my next point. Um, in this talk, I'm going to use a lot of terminology from agile software development, mostly Scrum. So who is familiar with Scrum? Right, so I'll ask the opposite question, who is not familiar with Scrum? It's no shame to raise your hand, all right. So, just to make sure that we are all on the same page, um, I'd like to begin with a really, really short introduction into how Scrum actually works. <coughs> all right, so when working with Scrum, um, yes, it's a process model for agile software development, and when working with Scrum, um, you usually define requirements that your software product is required to meet in the form of user stories. Um, you don't have to, but if you do Scrum really by the book, then usually um, that, is, that is the best practice. <coughs> One form that you can phrase user stories in is um, these templates. You, these templates, you find it in most of the literature on, on Scrum, there's this template. You can use other forms of writing user stories, but this is the most common. As a, mm -hmm, I want, mm, so that I have something from it. So this is really abstract, so let's have a look at um, a bit more practical example. So, for example, <coughs> let's imagine we have a simple project where we want to implement a website for our customer. Then a user story might, for example, be as an anonymous user, I want to register on the site so that I can use the site's personalized services. So we have a user role in here, the anonymous user. We have a feature that this story represents user registration on the site, and we also have a benefit that the user has from the story. Um, obviously, our customer wants to offer some personalized services on the site that users can use as soon as they are registered. So that's the benefit that the user has from this feature. <coughs> mm. Some authors, authors also say that uh, you can omit this, this benefit in the user story, but I think it's really it really makes sense that the benefit is in the user story. Because if you are writing a user story and you can't think of any benefit that you might put in there, then you probably shouldn't implement the feature at all because then you don't need it if you don't know what you need it for. <coughs> all right, so now some might say that um, it is not really possible to concentrate all the requirements that come along with a feature as big as user registration, registration into a single sentence, and yes, of course, that is uh, entirely correct. So usually you um, also write acceptance criteria for each user story. And if we stick with the user registration example, these acceptance criteria might look like um, in the menu there's a register item, on the register page the user can enter the following information, blah, 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 
And after registration, the user should receive a confirmation email. <coughs> so if the um, these story has been implemented by the development team um, during the phase of development, then you can take these acceptance criteria and if all criteria are met by the product um, that stands off the end of the sprint, I'll go a bit more into detail that next, um, then you can say that this story has been successfully implemented or long story short, is done. <coughs> this is the typical Scrum workflow that you're, that you're um, working with. Um, usually you put all your user stories that have not been implemented yet into the so-called product backlog. Um, you can imagine it just as a big stack of stories. And then you work in iterations, the so-called sprints. Typical sprint lengths are one to four weeks. At Midworld we usually do two weeks um, in exceptional cases, three weeks. And for each sprint, you select the stories from the, from the product backlog that you think you can manage to implement inside the sprint. <coughs> and when the sprint is over, you use the stories acceptance criteria to check are the story actually complete. And then you begin at the beginning once more. You pick the next set of stories, put them into the sprint backlog, and so on, until your product is done. <coughs> there are quite a few roles that persons can take inside a Scrum team. On this slide, we see that there is a development team. Of course, it's software development, so there's got to be developers somewhere in there. And we've also got a product owner. That's not all. Um, usually, usually, there are quite a lot of more roles in a Scrum project. There's Scrum Masters and there's the user and management and customers. Um, but these two roles are the ones that, in this case, we need to primarily concern ourselves with. And usually it works like this. The product owner represents our customer. He represents our customer's needs. He talks to the customer and brings all the requirements that our customer wants the software to meet into the Scrum team. So the product owner is usually the one who writes the user stories and puts them into the product backlog. But typically in a Scrum project, anyone can write these user stories. Um, for instance, as a an, as an developer, um, I'm a, I myself, I'm a, I'm a developer, um, often put user stories that, um, that represent non-functional requirements into the product backlog because that's something that, um, <coughs> that Product owner that, um, that a product owner who comes from a business perspective usually doesn't think about. For example, um, as a user, I want quick response time so that I can use the site fluently. Or as a user, I want a secure application so that my personal data is adequately protected. These are non-functional stories that anyone can put in the product backlog. So um, then on the team, select stories from the product backlog, put them into the sprint backlog, and then these stories are implemented. So at the end of each sprint, you have a so-called product increment. Um, that is the result of the stories that were picked into the sprint backlog. This is always sometimes called a potentially shippable product. So this means that this product in itself should already be as much as possible done and fully implemented. And because we have these acceptance criteria um, that are attached to the user stories, I've shown the criteria for the user registration. At the end of the sprint, we can check using these acceptance criteria if all the requirements are actually met. So in the most simple case, you would, uh, we would have all acceptance criteria on a piece of paper and we would take a pen and say, yes, there's a menu item called register, check. Um, there's a form with the following fields, check, check, check. And we receive an email, check. <coughs> so, yes, and usually this is done manually. So the acceptance criteria are tested manually. So someone has to sit in front of a computer, open a browser, click, 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 click. <coughs> and Yes, that is the point of behavior-driven development in order to maybe automate this process. 
But before going to speak about actual behavior-driven development, um, I'd like to talk about test-driven development. Who's familiar with test-driven development? All right, most people, that is good. <coughs> mm. Usually every developer has to ask himself, um, how can you be sure that the software that you develop actually works, actually does what you intend your software to do? And yes, in order to ensure that all these requirements are met, yes, you test. And because software developers and computer scientists in general are usually typically lazy, um, this kind of testing <coughs> can be automated. Mm. Here we are speaking about unit tests. So when developing software, you usually write unit tests for each unit of your program. By unit, I mean single methods, single classes, single files that are tested with automated tests. This is a typical iteration when doing test-driven development. Um, <coughs> in this case, you follow the test-first principle. So this means that you do not write your program first and then write the tests to test this program, but you write the tests first. So we start here at the top. We write a test, and because there's no actual program yet, this test, of course, fails, because if there's no software, the software cannot meet our requirements. So we write a failing test. Then we write the program code to make this test pass. Then we can refactor this code, make, maybe make it a little better, a little more performant, a little more secure. Maybe refactor the entire application architecture if we like it. Um, <coughs> and while we do this, we still have our test to ensure that nothing breaks during refactoring. And then you write the next test that also fails. Again, write the code to make the test pass, refactor, and so on, and so on. Um, depending on how, active you, um, on how actively you actually do this, um, these iterations usually take, for an experienced developer, maybe a, a few seconds to minutes. So failing test, writing code, refactor, maybe, maybe not, next failing test, write code, refactor, and so on. And that you do all day, but it actually makes fun to see red bubbles turn into green bubbles. <coughs> yeah, I hear people laughing, but it's, it's, actually, uh, <laughs> it's actually quite satisfying. So, um, but we're still talking all about unit tests. So we are testing single classes, single methods, and that is a really good way to ensure software quality. But while I would say that unit tests are necessary for good software quality, unit tests are not sufficient for good software quality. With unit tests, we can ensure that each of our software components individually works as we expect it to work. But that doesn't guarantee us that all the components that we have written uh, work together as well as we expect them to be. Um, maybe a little real life analogy, um, when you are building a house, then you might, mm, for example, have a look at the lamps that you are going to build in the house and um, before you buy the lamps, you check, does, do these lamps actually work? Um, then you do the same with the light switches. You get a light switch, uh, mount it into a testing rack and check, does this switch, this switch really work? And uh, yes, the switch works. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't, when the house is built, um, still actually flip the switch when it's built in to see if the light actually goes on. Because just because you know that your light switch is working and because you know that your light bulb is working, that doesn't mean that maybe the wiring is shut between these two components. Maybe there's a breaker switch somewhere in the basement that isn't in. Maybe your house doesn't have any power, who knows? So what you have to do is an integration test. You have to test all these components working together. <coughs> and let's stay with our house analogy. Um, 
we can also formulate this integration test from a user kind of perspective. Because the user, the person who later has to actually live in this house that we are trying to build, he doesn't really care about lamps and light, switch, light switches and breakers, switches and power lines. He don't, doesn't really care. Um, he just wants to have light in his house when it's dark outside. So <clears throat> you could also formulate this requirement from a user perspective. I want light in my house. Or when I hit the light switch, there should be light. When I hit the light switch again, it should be dark again. So that is the same integration test formulated from a user kind of perspective. And this is actually something that could already be an acceptance criteria in a user story where I have said, as a house inhabitant, I want to have light so that I don't have to sit in the dark. <coughs> um, well, of course, now we are not building houses, we are building software, but you can do the same with software. <coughs> mm. Of course, you need quite, um, quite a lot of software to help with automated acceptance tests. Um, but there are quite a lot of good tools for that. Mm. At Midworld, a good part of the applications that we develop are actually web applications. And a good tool for testing web applications is, for example, Selenium. I don't know who has, who has heard of Selenium. Right, most people, that's good. <coughs> and we started doing automated acceptance tests with Selenium, I, I believe it was somewhere one or two years ago. Um, and we already knew PHP unit. We had been doing unit tests with PHP unit for quite some time. And then we saw, oh, there's a PHP unit extension that you can use with Selenium. So, because we thought, uh, not too many new software all at once, let's, let's use the PHP unit extension for Selenium, because we know PHP unit. And we wrote automated acceptance tests with PHP unit and Selenium. So, you would run a PHP unit test suite, which would talk to a Selenium server. The Selenium server would actually start a browser opening your application and you could control the browser using the, PH, um, using the PHP unit Selenium API. And these test cases looked like this. I don't know if you can read it from the back seat. <coughs> um, I, did not made, I did not make this up. There's actually an actual test somewhere at Midworld floating around that looks just like this. <coughs> so, um, Yes, and while this test actually does work, it does run through, although these are not production credentials. So no, you cannot log in with 12346 and super secret into the Midworld customer center. That doesn't work. <coughs> mm. But this test runs through. The downside is that it is not really obvious what this test actually tests. So if you do have extensive knowledge in PHP programming and you know how PHP unit works and you know the Selenium WebDriver API and you are able to understand how these XPath XML queries work, then you, you should be able to understand what this test actually tests. So for developers, this is great. Um, these XPath expressions, they do have a certain charm. I personally hate them, XML processing, blah. Um, <clears throat> but actually what we're doing here is that we are testing acceptance criteria and these are formulated from a user perspective. The user story is formulated from a user perspective. Our acceptance criteria are formulated from a user perspective, but unfortunately this test is absolutely unreasonable, unreadable from a user perspective. So if someone with a non-technical background, like for example a product owner, in a, in a Scrum project, would see this kind of test. I don't know, what does it do? It's just rubbish. <coughs> and yes, that is, that is really kind of sad because um, the product owner is the one who uh, is responsible for writing the user stories. He is responsible for writing the acceptance criteria, but he has no way of understanding what this huge blob of code actually does. <coughs> so, now I would like to introduce a way to 
tackle this kind of problem. So I'd like to introduce gherkin, and no, I do not mean the things that you can eat. Um, gherkin in German, it means Gewürzgurke. Um, I don't know, software developers do have humor, I suppose. <coughs> so, no, I am not talking about gurken, I'm talking about the language gherkin. And in the official documentation, gherkin is described as a business-readable, domain-specific language for writing behavior specifications. And I've also allowed myself to put business writable in there with, with a question mark. Um, we'll talk about that later. <coughs> because um, in the end, these um, kind of acceptance tests that I have just shown, these are behavioral, behavioral specifications. They specify how our software is supposed to behave. When I enter these values into the login form and press submit, then that should happen. When I hit the light switch, there should be light. <coughs> so these are behavior specifications. And the same test that I have just shown in PHP unit, this one, formulated in Gherkin, just looks like this. So I'll leave a few moments to let this uh, sink in. <coughs> and I believe the first thing that we can say about this is that it is a lot less of code. It's only six lines of code. And you don't need to know a lot about PHP development to know what this specification actually specifies. You don't need to know about XPath expressions, you don't need to know about PHP unit, you don't need to know about Selenium. <coughs> Basically, this is just plain text with a, little, with a little indention at the beginning of the line. So, this is, a, this is something that can easily be read from persons with a non-technical background, and I dare say that this kind of test could also have been written by our product owner himself. <coughs> um, yes, this is a comparison of the, line, of the actual lines of code. Um, I cheated a bit here. Um, you'll, you'll see later on why. Um, but this kind of test actually is executable, um, given the right tools. So there are tools that can interpret this language and actually execute this code, as we see it here, without any further adaptions. And I think that's pretty cool. So, yes, I've talked a lot about tools, so let me tell you about tools that you can work with. <coughs> the first tool that introduced Gherkin as a language for specifying behavior um, was called Cucumber. Um, yes, there we are with, with Gurken again. Um, Cucumber is a tool written in Ruby. Who is familiar with Ruby development? I'm not. You're not either. Do oh, one, one. Who is familiar with PHP development? Yeah, great, great. <laughs> <coughs> so, Cucumber was the original tool that was used to interpret Gurken specifications, but well, for a few months or years, there's also a tool called Behat, and it is implemented in PHP. And for us as PHP developers, this is, of course, far more cooler than Ruby. This is, uh, the, tip, uh, this is the application architecture of Behat. Um, there's a very cool extension for Behat. It is called Mink. And Mink offers interfaces to all the browser control servers that we already know, like Selenium. So, using Mink, you can use step definitions inside your Gherkin test that automatically fire up a Selenium browser in the background, start a browser, and that navigate through your web, through your web application. There's also an interface to Zahi. Zahi is basically the same as Selenium, just from a different vendor. I, I don't think it's open source, but I don't really know. Um, Zombie is also very cool. Zombie is a headless JavaScript browser, so that you can use it to test JavaScript applications without the need of firing up a full brown Firefox. <coughs> mm. Yes, you can install it very easily um, using Composer. Um, I think we've already heard quite a, quite a lot 
about Composer in the last few months and weeks. <coughs> mm. This would be a typical Composer JSON file in which you specify your software requirements. You don't, re you don't need all of these drivers, usually just a Selenium driver or a Sahi driver. <coughs> and that's, yes, then, then you can get going. So, now how can you write actual acceptance tests using, using BHAT? Because using MINK, uh, also using BHAT and MINK in conjunction, you can use it for writing simple UI tests. But a UI test is not the same as an acceptance test. So, for example, let's have a look at this kind of test. I've actually seen lots of tests like these. And in there it says, given I am on index PHP question mark ID equals five blah, and I fill in username with, and I fill in blah, 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 and I press, then I should be on index PHP and so on and so on. So the question I would like to ask, is this an actual acceptance test? Yes, it, it is formulated in Gherkin, so one might be tempted to say, yes, it is, but is it really? I would dare say that it is not an acceptance test. Again, usually these tests are, formula are formulated from a user kind of perspective. And our user doesn't really care about the page IDs in the URLs. The user also doesn't care about the form names in, uh, in, the, in the registration form. And there's also a, a, a mailbox name, very cryptic down there. And our user doesn't care about this either. So, in conclusion, this test is in dire need of refactoring. And maybe this test being refactored might look like this. <clears throat> and as you can see, in Gherkin, we can group these test scenarios in, feature, in features. And in this case, the feature, again, was described in form of a user story. In order to use the site's personalized features as a user, I want to register, and so on. So basically, this thing that we have here is a user story with acceptance criteria. And the only difference to the example that I presented to you in the beginning of my talk is that this test is actually executable. <coughs> All right, there's, there's one little catch because you can't write, just write this, um, this, this kind of test down and expect BHAT to know what you mean when you say I should receive a confirmation mail. Um, because these step definitions do actually have to be implemented then again, either in Ruby or in PHP, depending on which tool you use. And this might look like this. <coughs> so behind each Gherkin acceptance test, there is also a step definition, definition file in which these definitions are mapped to actually PHP code. And yes, of course, in this code, you have then to connect to the mailbox that you expect your confirmation mail to be in. You have to check, is the email actually there? And yes, it's basically the same in Ruby. I don't know how you would do it there, but yeah, who cares? <coughs> so, and the, uh, granted, this is something that cannot be done anymore by the product owner. This has to be done by a developer. So this is how it looks like when we actually try to execute this test. Um, this is a mock, of course, um, and for the fun of it, I made the last step definition in this uh, fail. So we see that it is glowing red to alert us something failed. Mm. Currently, BHAT is a command line tool only, and additionally to these uh, very colorful command line output, we can also um, specify typical JUnit XML output files. So this means that we can also integrate a BHAT test suite into our continuous integration process to make sure that these tests run completely automated. Um, I don't, have, don't know if I'll have the time for this. No, probably not. Um, there are some slides in here about how to integrate these acceptance tests into your CI process. I'll go over it rather quickly to save time for the other stuff that I want to talk about. <clears throat> so this is the workflow that um, 
we have found works quite well. Um, usually we do it like this. The product owner writes the user stories as, as, as usual in Scrum. And along with the user stories, he also writes the acceptance tests. He would write the acceptance criteria anyway, but now he, instead of in a prose form, uh, form they are written in executable Gherkin syntax. As you have seen, it's, it's basically just plain text, so it's not that big of a deal. And during the sprint, the development team can refine these acceptance criteria, maybe add a few more. And of course, the step definitions have to be implemented because um, <clears throat> who knows what, uh, what requirements are, are formulated inside of these stories. And what is pretty cool that the acceptance tests can also be used as a completion measure during the sprint. This means that um, you can use these tests to check how far am I actually? Um, what is our progress inside the sprint? And of course, as a project manager, this gives you also the ability to notice early on if something goes wrong. For example, if the sprint is, has, is halfway done, but only 20% of all acceptance tests actually pass, then you, you usually know that you probably won't be able to implement all these stories by the end of the sprint. And you can see this quite early on. <coughs> so, yes, all right, this is what I was talking about with the CI process. I'm going to skip over this um, a bit more quickly. So, these are possible, um, possible build, by build pipelines for your deployment process. And the main question is when to run these acceptance tests inside your build pipeline. So this is not just a build pipeline, it's pipeline is also a deployment pipeline. So we're not doing continuous integration, but also continuous delivery. But that's, I don't want to go too much into detail on this. Um, the main thing to keep in mind is that while unit tests usually run very quick, acceptance tests are very slow. Because when testing JavaScript applications, for example, um, you need to, to use Selenium and then you need to start a Firefox browser or a Chrome browser for each test. And you have to navigate through the application, wait until the page is loaded. And this can take quite a lot of, quite a lot of time. So if, when, when doing automated deployment, you have to ask yourself the question, when are these acceptance tests actually supposed to run? But there's another point I'd, I'd like to talk about um, even more, and that is about how to sell behavior-driven development to your customer, to your management, um, because usually this can be quite a difficult task. Fortunately, I cannot speak from own experience there, but um, the problem, just as with test-driven development, is that from a business perspective, there's no immediate benefit on writing tests. Um, the customer could, for example, say, oh, why do you want to write test code? I'm not paying for this. You just want to charge more hours. And yes, let's see what we can say about that. So first of all, um, at the end of the sprint, you usually have to test all these acceptance criteria. If not automated, then you have to do it manually. And strictly speaking, you have to test all stories that already had been implemented in the sprints before, again, because possibly there's a regression somewhere in it and a feature that had already been implemented in a sprint before broke by something else. Usually you have unit tests to cover for that, but as I just said, unit tests aren't everything. So, um, first of all, when you automate this, you can save a lot of time if probably not all, t all the time, but you can significantly reduce the amount of time that you spend on manual software testing. So, and since in most cases time also equals money, yes, you can also save money with this. Another point, I've already talked about this, is that you can measure your progress objectively and easily. Um, yes, I've, I've already talked about that. Another point, 
um, when using execu executable behavior specifications, these specifications are usually more precise than when just written in prose text. So, for example, if we stay with our user registration example from the beginning, um, we're not doing automatic acceptance tests. Our product owner could just write as an acceptance criteria, user registration works. An experienced product owner probably wouldn't do this, and an experienced development team would also say, no, please rephrase it. But, well, these things can happen. And so, for the sake of argument, let's say that we do have a user story and with, uh, with the sole acceptance criteria, user registration works. Then the development team comes along, implements the user registration, and then the product owner tries to test the story and then goes to the, to the developer and says, I didn't receive a confirmation mail. Where's my confirmation mail? And then the developer says, oh, you didn't write anything about, a con uh, <coughs> about any mailings. Um, why didn't you say so? And that is very annoying because then the story has to be reformulated and it has to be taken in the next print. It is not done yet. And that can be really frustrating. And yes, in general, acceptance criteria tend to be a lot more precise when written in an executable form. And they can also be, this works both ways, they can also be implemented more precisely. So you reduce the risks of misunderstanding, of stories being not understood correctly, of specific specifications not being written correctly. You reduce the risk of that happening significantly. And, of course, the most important point when using behavior-driven development, I think um, it allows you to simply create software that simply works. And which is also important to create software that actually keeps working. Because when you have this set of acceptance tests that you can execute, you don't throw these away. Um, you can execute this test at any later time that you want. So typically you could, you could run them regularly on, on, a, on a testing system that you have maybe to check that maybe other features or other projects that have been implemented in the meantime, do not introduce any kind of regressions into the features that have already been implemented. <coughs> so, um, yes, we're admit, admit that we're not doing behavior-driven development in all projects currently, but we're experimenting with it um, too at the, at the moment. So, but, but I think there's, there's quite a lot of potential in it um, to, to improve communication within the team, to reduce misunderstandings, and to simply work more effectively inside the team. Mm. Yeah, all right, I do have a few minutes left, so I can just talk about um, some other points that are not in these slides. Um, one, one, yes, one, one issue that has arisen when experimenting with behavior-driven development is this, this behead command line tool. Because usually without having a technical background, you usually don't work with command line tools. So um, the first time we experimented with this, um, this is not yet integrated into our CI process, so it is not done fully automatically. Um, and in, in one instance, our product owner came to me and said, Martin, I want to execute this test. How can I do that? And of course, then you cannot tell your product owner to install Selenium and the Chrome driver API and PHP and Composer on his uh, uh, Windows 8 notebook. Um, that just doesn't work. So, <coughs> um, yes, one thing that that we have missed um, is some kind of a, of a, of a better interface for Behead. Um, maybe a server-side application that you can just use to 
to write these behavior specifications may be integrated also with a Git repository, because that's another point. We, we version our feature definitions in a Git repository, but I can't expect our product owner to work with Git. That just doesn't work. <coughs> so, yes, maybe some kind of, of graphical server user interface for this would be nice. All right, um, yes, that's roughly about all I had to say, I think. Yes, time's looking good. Um, I think we have time for a few questions, if you have any. So, please, shoot. Yes, please. Uh, do you work with external customers with this, or, or no. with the product it's, it's purely internal. But um, I think this would be, this would be um, I would I would be interested in this myself. How this works with external customers? Yes. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, one thing that you can do is um, when using the mink extension for Behead, there's a predefined set of definitions that you can use. Um, you can also do a, quite a lot with this in, in your typical web application scenario. So there are step definitions for given I am on a page with URL blub, 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 and, I've, and I fill in this form field with this value, and I click on this link, and I click on this button. Um, you can already do quite a lot with that. Um, regarding the other point, um, at the moment, we, um, we, we've, um, yes, one possible way to do it would be to let the product owner simply write down what he or she wants, and when the developer tries to run these tests, you usually get error messages about this step is not yet implemented and that step is not yet implemented. And then you can refine these definitions. And you see, oh, maybe we've had a step definitions that just does exactly like, um, that does just that. Um, and is maybe just formulated in a bit of a different way. So you could then in a second step refine these um, feature definitions to match the step definitions that you already have, or then you or you implement new ones. Uh, does that answer the question? Or? All right, great. Yes. Um, how large can these tests grow? Um, an example uh, with Selenium, we tested some TD server workflow with conditions and going back and mm -hmm. entering again, and in, on each step we asserted we are on the product page. We Um, yeah, the, yes and no. Control structures are difficult to implement. Um, technically, yeah, technically you cannot implement control, control structures at all, but what you can do is to um, run the same scenario with different input data. That, it, it's, not the, it's not the same, I know, but um, that's just about it. Uh, so you can't formulate a specification th that does something like, like, if this condition is met, then I should do that else, that, or do this until that happens. That's not possible in BIAT currently. Yes? Uh, is there an instrument to make um, 
Uh, sorry, I didn't get it uh, acoust acoustically. Ah, um, yes, we haven't done any experimenting on that currently. Um, we are tracking our user stories actually quite traditionally on paper, um, on a board. So um, we haven't really worked with, with GUI integration on this. Um, but a Jenkins integration of these, um, these BHA tests is possible, of course. Um, you can store the test results in a JUnit XML file, and then you can use Jenkins to parse <laughs> these JUnit XML files. So that is possible, yes. Ah, all right. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, yes, yes. I, I, I don't believe there's, there's something for that, but it is a good idea, actually. Right, so if there's no further questions, then thank you for staying with me, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.